Hi. Hey. Slide deck. 20 minutes. That's not a long time. That might be a long time. I don't know. I haven't given this talk before. So um, have any of you played the Untitled Goose game? I really like it. <laughs> so yeah, I'm from Erlang uh, Solutions and I work out of London. My accent is from Copenhagen, Denmark. So um, this talk will be about queues and I, I wanted to, uh, to just introduce you to why I think this is an interesting topic for Erlang. Because uh, one of the primitives that we have in the language is the, um, is the humble process and we can spawn it with the, with the spawn command. And uh, the process is a unit of computation. Like, it can run a function, and um, when it does so, we usually run a recursive function within a process, and this is basically keeping it alive. Um, the recursive function will reduce over a state, and this is basically how a uh, gen server works. So every time we, um, we get into... Um, we, we get into a receive where we will receive something and we call that uh, receive loop. Is everyone following this? Good, good, good. So our processes, they have an identifier. And um, any process that knows about another process's identifier can send it a message. But, um, but this picture that I show you here is just half the story because the, um, the process will in reality send the message to a message queue that we, we call uh, a mailbox. So when the, uh, when the process on the, uh, on the left here will, uh, on the right, will, um, <laughs> will run a receive, it will process the, uh, the message from the blue one. And they will re arrive in order, like they will be processed in order. So it's a first in, first out queue. Unless we, like, if we just disregard the, the concept of a selective receive where we, we just manually receive based on a pattern match. But in, uh, in a gen server, you, you would like to avoid doing that because of reasons. <laughs> Many reasons, there. So, of course, Multiple processes can send uh, a message to the same process. And in this case, we think some, some messages will requir require more computation than others. So the pink uh, letter here will, will require more uh, computation. So the, the blue one will wait for it to be processed. And, um, and this situation is called head of line blocking. So usually in gen servers, when we use a call, we, um, we have a five second timeout. And this is how we handle, like, um, usually in Erlang systems and Elixir systems, of course, we, um, we use timeouts to, to prevent, uh, prevent the system from, from just holding. So this means that, um, our process here will, will just terminate after five seconds per default. Of course, this is uh, this you can set per message. So we have to find a way to, um, to avoid the situation where a single process is uh, congested and uh, cannot handle all the, the, the work we throw at it. And one, one way we could do that is we could do a round robin where we have a process that just receives the messages and then dispatch it doing like one, two, three, one, two, three. Or we could do a more sophisticated uh, strategy where we evaluate the data we get in and then doing some heuristic could, could send a third of the requests in this direction and a third in another and a third in, in a third. Um, and this is good if we, if we have a requirement that messages has a destination that they need to reach. So this is interesting because uh, everything is a queue and a, at a greater scale. Like your network printer, especially your network printer is a queue. Um, your database, like the thing in the middle could also be uh, a foreign system of some kind. Um, when you're in the supermarket, you know queues, you know queues from everywhere. Like, 
basing your whole language on cues is, is a pretty natural way of thinking about things. Um, so that is why I like Elixir, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so, um, we have to think about how we, we deal with these queues, and uh, at the end of the queue, there's usually a shared resource. So, let's discuss some, uh, some strategies that we can use. A pool. We could have a connection pool, and, uh, and these usually look like this, where we, we have a, a pool between the, uh, the shared resource and a caller. And the, uh, the pool will keep a set of um, a set number of connections we can do to, for instance, a database. So the pool could be have five available slots, and uh, and then we could like, we check out a connection, and then we we get a reference, and up in the top you can see that we now have n minus one available, and and then when we have our time in the queue or time in the pool. We, we can do stuff to a database. And then when we're done, we, um, we are nice enough to put it back into the pool, such that others can use, our, um, use the reference. So um, while this provides us with concurrency, uh, there, there's a problem. If, we, if there's no more available slots in the queue, then uh, we have the same problem as we had before with the uh, header line blocking. And if we are, if we are, if our process is waiting for a time in the pool and there's a five second um, timeout and and that timeout is reached, then the client that calls uh, the process that calls will um, will end up terminating itself. So we can use another strategy called a rate limiter, and this works by um, by either sending the request to the shared resource or, or just dropping the data. So, uh, first a rate limiter will do some kind of measurement. And then a caller will call into the rate limiter, ask, uh, like, am I allowed to do this? And then if it is, then we send, we perform the request to a shared resource. And then we, um, we will get a success response. So in the, uh, in the case that we perform the measurement and we, we determine that we, we can't handle enough load here, um, we, we simply we can't handle the load. So we just thread the request and then tell the caller that their process was, or their message was not delivered. Um, so the question is, what should we measure? And, uh, and a good thing to measure is uh, the, the average time it takes for message to get through the queue. Uh, or we could, we could have some kind of token-based system. Um, and, but this is all based on uh, observation. So it could be that a certain sudden spike could, um, could tilt over the system. Uh, and also we have to think about, is it, is it okay to just thread messages? Sometimes we, um, we care about our data, sometimes we Sometimes we don't. Um, like a request to a search engine is not as important as a as a bank transfer, for instance. Um, yeah, and um, well, the good thing here is that the the caller doesn't crash if we cannot deliver the message. We can we can try again later. So a third, I think it's the third. Yeah, the, a third um, strategy is circuit breakers, and I called it fuse here because it looked better on the slide. Circuit breaker was just too long. <laughs> so. Circuit breakers, they, uh, they work like they do in your house. If you, if you put too much currency through your, through your house, then the, the circuit breaker will, will blow before your house burns, we, which is uh, admirable. <laughs> so we... Um, in the fuse scenario, we will we will ask this uh, fuse about uh, like, are we good? And then the fuse will say, not blown. And then we will make the request to a shared resource. But in the case that uh, the shared resource has gone away for for whatever reason, we have overloaded it or something. Um, 
we will still ask Diffuse, and uh, Diffuse will, uh, will reply with not blown. And then uh, we will make the request, and that will result in an error. And then we will tell the fuse that, hey, we, um, we saw an error, so we melt the fuse. And what we're doing here is we, the fuse will have a window of, um, of, um, of melt. So when we record a melt, it will, it will go into this window. And then when a certain uh, amount of errors has been reached, then we will we'll start reporting blown. So we ask the fuse for the state. The, the database over there is still down. Now it will uh, return blown, and then <laughs> we, we basically, the good thing about this is we basically um, cache the error. So we can respond really, really fast with an error instead of trying to go to the database and say, oh no, no, cannot do it. So the fuse will run a timer, that's this window. And it will try to reset, reset the fuse. At which point we can um, we can start making requests to the shared resource again. Should the database still be down at this point, we would just continue melting the fuse, and it will it will break fairly quickly, and then we will be back to the blown state, and the rest of our system can can work with that. So we we basically have to have two. We have to think into our system what will happen when our fuse is broken. And of course, in our systems, we can have uh, part of the system down. Like, not everything in the system is critical for the system to be up and functional. Like, if we have some kind of visit counter or something like that, it's, it's OK if, if it doesn't report anything right now. Like, we can still surf the web pages. Um, so, a good circuit breaker will um, will allow you to to do stuff like um, when the system is healing after a crash, the shared resource. Um, we can allow, say, 20% of the traffic to go through and just fail 80% of the the traffic, and we can we can then gradually like make this success number bigger and bigger until we are back at 100% again, and we can that that is a good property because then we can. Um, we can ensure that the uh, that the remote system is up and running again, 100%. Uh, because if we just allow every every uh, request to go through as it's going up, we can have a thundering horde effect where we will just like the system will get up and then we will just push all of our um, requests in and then we will pull down the system again. So fairly neat strategy. Demand driven. <laughs> These works by, uh, by reversing the problem. So we have a shared resource and then we have a, a process that controls the demand and we have consumers that connects to the demand. So we, the consumer will tell the demand controller that we, we can handle n items at this point in time. The, uh, the demand will go to the resource and say, hey, give me, give me some stuff. I, I got customers. And then the consumer will get the amount that it asked for, and then it can process it, process it, and then it can continue doing it over and over again. So, um, so this is a fairly, fairly good way to, to go about um, handling resources where we don't really have a like it's, it's not time critical, but we have a lot of work to do. And we can, it's also pretty good to, to be able to just spawn processes uh, that can consume from the, and post demand to the resource. So we can, it's, it's a pretty good way of handling a varying amount of data that we need to, we need to process. And um, of course, in, in the Alexia sphere, we got gen stage for this one. So this is my uh, my final slide, and I got around five minutes left. So I spoke a bit quicker than I anticipated. So I can I can give some recommendations for uh, for what implementations to to use of these strategies that I've gone through. And um, 
top left corner with the pools, we got something called pool bore, but it it kind of have uh, it has this problem where when there's no more connections left, then it will just the clients calling in will just fail. Um, there's one called connection by uh, James uh, Fishcakes that will solve that problem by uh, having a timeout on the on the amount of time you can you can have you can have the connection. For the rate limiter, um, I'm not a great Dane. Well, I'm not a great Dane, but <laughs> if you say so. Um, <laughs> yes, but Louis Erlang, user of the year 2017, he has created a rate limiter called Safety Valve, which is, which is pretty good. It's, um, it's tested with quick check, so you know it works. Fuse. Um, circuit breakers, there's one called Fuse, also by Jesper Lewis, also tested with quick check, it works, um, and it's pretty good. I think Fuse is my favorite of the, of the strategies that I've gone uh, through today. And of course, demand-driven, we, we have uh, GenStage by the um, Elixir Core team. So that should give me four minutes for questions, which I think don't be... Yeah.